Capital Queers, Alex Reynolds Mystery, Book 3, author Fred Hunter, publisher St. Martin's Press, New York, 1999, narrator Eric Ost. Chapter 5, a Sunday morning, Peter left at about 9.30 for his job as premier salesman at Farratz, the Fay men's clothing store. As for my own work, business was definitely not booming. Since getting involved as queer in residence at the CIA, I'm afraid my interest in graphic art had dwindled. This wasn't smart, because a freelance business can take a long time to build up and even longer to regain. And frankly, our CIA assignments were way too few and far between, not to mention trivial. But I still had a few steady clients for whom I designed brochures, booklets, and the like. And they pretty much provided the needed spending money, giving mother's inheritance and her refusal to charge us rent. That was all I really needed. So I was home when mother called Ryan to check up on him. There was no answer. You don't think he would have gone to work today, do you? I said as she hung up the receiver after her second attempt. There's no telling, she replied with a shrudge. Some people find it easier to work after a tragedy than to just sit home alone and brood on it. Was it my imagination, I said, or did you get the impression uh, that Ryan was hiding something too? Hiding something? Last night at dinner, when I was asking him about this past week, she thought a moment, then shook her head. He wasn't normal, but that's to be expected. I don't know how much I'd make of it at this point. I don't mean... I mean, when I talked about the dolls, he seemed awfully interested in the last doll Mason bought. Mother's lip drew up to one side. You mean you were interested in it? You're projecting, darling. I shook my head. I don't think so. I think there was something odd about that doll. He told you straight away that there wasn't. Then he asked about whether or not it was smashed. What's wrong with that? And what we'd done with the rest of the dolls? He wanted to go home. He probably just wanted to make sure he wouldn't have to look at them. I shook my head again and said, But he asked about that doll specifically. Mother sighed heavily and waved me off with a smile. You've got dolls on the brain. I never should have let you play with them when you were little. Look what's happened. She tried to call Ryan a couple more times before Peter got home from work. After we'd had dinner, she gave me a sheepish grin and said, I wonder if my boys would mind doing something for me. Sure, said Peter, always agreeable once he's been fed. I wonder if you'd go over and check on Ryan? He's got me just a little mithered with his not answering the phone. He probably just doesn't want to talk to anybody, I said. Perhaps, but would you mind? Neither Peter nor I could see what it would hurt to check on Brian, so we walked down the street to his two flat. The second floor apartment was dark as far as we could see, while at least one of the living room lights was on in Ryan's apartment. As anyone from Chicago knows, the presence of a light doesn't necessarily signal the presence of an occupant. But I would have been surprised if he'd chosen to go out. We went through the front door of the building to the door of his apartment. I pressed the bell and waited. There was no answer. After a minute or so, I pressed the bell again, then knocked. Ryan, I called through the closed door. It's me and Peter. We just want to make sure you're all right. Still no answer. Do you have your keys? said Peter. I left them at home. Try the door. I did what in the movies is described as a slow take and said, No, you try the door. The last time I did that, I got in big trouble. Peter hesitated for a moment then said, Oh, honestly, as if he was disgusted with our mutual timidity. My stomach did an abrupt flip when Peter tried the door and found it was unlocked. Past personal experience and exposure to hundreds of horror movies over the last years told me that this was a bad sign. Peter pushed the door and the door slid open with a loud creak. 
Even in the dim light, we could see a trail of blood on the living room carpet. Call the police, I whispered urgently to Peter. He started to turn away, and I grabbed his arm. No, call Frank. He glanced back into the living room, turned to look me squarely in the eye, and said, Alex, come away from here. I pulled my arm away. No, he might be... Shh, Peter replied as harshly as he could without raising his voice. We don't know what's happened, and we don't know if anybody's still in there. I don't care, I said anxiously. It might not be too late. Even if somebody's there, I have to help Ryan. Peter hesitated a split second, just long enough for his anxiety over my welfare to be overcome by the knowledge that I was right, and ran off down the street to get help. I looked into the apartment craning my neck as far around the door jam as I possibly could while still maintaining an easy escape. The trail of blood stretched back down the hallway. Nobody was in sight. There were no sounds. I decided the best plan of attack was to make some noise from where I was. Ryan? I called out loudly. I hoped that if an assailant was there, this would startle him into making his escape by the back door. Though the first sign of blood had brought to mind that Way Mason had been killed, it now occurred to me that it was possible that Ryan, in the state in which we'd last seen him, might have decided to take his own life. I called his name once more, very loudly before venturing into the apartment. I slowly followed the trail of blood across the Navajo rug in the living room and into the dining room, then down the hardwood floor of the hallway, all the while trying to keep close to the wall as if that would hide me from anyone who might come dodging out of another room, I realized with a sense of dread that the trail led back to Mason's doll room. When I reached the doorway, I paused for a moment. I was surprised to discover I'd been neglecting to breathe. I took a couple of deep breaths and exhaled. As quietly as possible, the door was slightly ajar. I stayed plastered against the wall and pushed the door back with the fingers of my right hand. Ryan was lying in the middle of the room. His stomach was cut open. Peter returned out of breath. By the look of him, he'd expected to find me fighting off some unknown assassin. Instead, he found me sitting on the couch, slumped forward with my head almost touching my knees. I wasn't trying to keep from throwing up or passing out. Though both were possibilities, I just didn't feel like I had the energy to hold my head up any longer. I told him that Ryan was dead in the doll room, and he started to go back there, but I took his hand and said, You don't want to see it. With enough intensity that Peter realized at once that he really didn't want to see it. He said he'd tried Frank O'Neill's number at area headquarters, but had struck out. Unfortunately, Frank had gone off duty. I'm really sorry, he said with genuine remorse. But I was so worried about you being back here alone that I went ahead and told them that something was wrong here. So they're sending someone over, but I don't know who. I told them this was where Mason was killed the day before yesterday. And that seemed to pique their interest, especially since I was calling on Frank's private line. That's okay. There was no way around it. Peter sat beside me and slipped an arm over my shoulder. I called Frank at home when I got off the phone with his office. Is he coming? I said, the anxiety in my voice, almost making Peter start. Yeah, he said he'd be here as soon as he could, but someone from his department should be here first. About five minutes had passed when we heard the steady chop of the detective's arrival. We knew at once that mentioning Mason's murder had been a mistake. They sent Billings. Since it had been his case, the front of the dark hair was matted to his forehead with sweat, and he was wearing the same suit he'd worn two days ago. It still hadn't been cleaned. Little drops of perspiration clung like dew to the area just above his eyebrows and somehow made his eyes look beadier. He looked at me and folded his arm, his face smudged with a smug smile. I looked up at him, hoping my expression could show the amount of disdain I felt at the sight of him. I tossed a thumb in the direction of the doll room and said, He's back there. It's Ryan Morton. Mason. Lapierre's husband. 
A clump of nasty little wrinkles appeared on either side of Billings' nostrils at the word husband, but apparently he was at least worried enough about my knowing his commander that he ha didn't hazard to say anything. I suppose he wasn't worried about giving me a dirty look since it would sound much more idiotic if I complained to his superior about his face. Your detective was giving me dirty looks. Sounds awfully silly coming out of a man in his mid-thirties, no matter how light he is in his loafers. Billings turned away from Peter and me, dropped his hands into his pockets, and made off down the hallway. His partner went in as far as the entrance of the hallway and stopped. I suppose there was some silent understanding between them that he was supposed to keep an eye on us. Uh, Billings returned in a matter of seconds. He frowned his way through the dining room, shaking his head in disgust. By the time he reached us, the smug smile had reappeared. Looks like somebody wants to make a salad out of you guys. After going to his car to radio for whomever it is they call, Billings took a seat on the opposite side of the coffee table from us. His partner, whom Billings steadfastly refused to introduce by name, stood at the end of the couch looming over us. It was a childish tactic on their part, but recognizing it as such didn't make it any less effective. You guys seem to be showing up around a lot of dead bodies. We've been uncommonly unlucky this week, Peter replied, but not as unlucky as our friends. Billings looked at Peter as if he were something the detective had just scraped off his shoe. He leaned toward us, his eyes narrowing so that they looked like tiny black ball bearings stuck in the middle of a crescent. Let me tell you something. He stopped just sort of saying, faggot. And that's not just my imagination. Any gay person can recognize when someone has stopped just short of calling him a faggot. Billings apparently knew that even in the midst of a threat, he couldn't cross that line. Let me tell you something, buddy boys. You may think you're pretty damn cute, but I'm here to tell you, you keep turning up with dead bodies. And it ain't gonna matter if you know the king of France. You're gonna be in deep shit. You got that? I had to fight the urge to say something about the king of France and Richard the Lionheart, but... I decided we pushed our luck enough already. Now, we got two dead guys here. This guy and his friend. And you knew both of them. That looks pretty damn suspicious to me. <sighs> they were a couple, Detective, I said, evenly trying to control my anger. Anyone who knew Mason knew Ryan. Mm-hmm, Billings replied. Peter reached out and tapped the gold band on Billings' finger. The detective actually flinched. This means you're married, doesn't it? What's that got to do with anything, said Billings, rubbing his finger as if he'd been burned. Peter explained as if he were talking to a two-year-old. Mason and Ryan were like you and your wife. If someone murdered you both, you could hardly suspect someone just because they knew the two of you. It's not the same thing. Billings' cheeks went a nasty red. Yes, it is. The detective tried to bring himself under control, but it's extremely difficult to take deep breaths, surreptitiously. Well, I want to tell you something, buddy. I got two dead faggots. Apparently, he no longer cared how he chose his words. And the only good faggot is a dead faggot. Isn't that right, detective? I snapped. Alex, said Peter in a cautioning tone. Although he found Billings as disgusting as I did, he didn't see any reason to further antagonize him. Billings continued as if I hadn't said anything. The same kind of ritual killing and the same two guys on the scene. I don't care who you are. That don't look good, does it? He leaned towards us again. His face seemed to float in the air like a dew-speckled melon. What is it, huh? Some kind of cult? Some church? Or you guys just decided to carve each other up? How many pills does it take to get you to sleep at night, I said. Billing's stare grew colder, if that was possible. 
He said back and folded his arms. I don't give a flying fuck if the whole bunch of you kill yourselves off. The world would be a better place, but not in my area. Come on, guys. You're making me look like I care. It's a living, isn't it? Look, he said loudly, I want to know what the hell the two of you are were doing here tonight. How you came to be the ones that found the body? That's simple, I explained, trying my best not to appear rattled. Ryan stayed with us after you charming people were through harassing him last night after dinner. He said he wanted to come back home, which he did. My mother was worried about him because we couldn't get hold of him by phone today. So when my husband, I stressed the term just to see Billings try to control himself some more, got home from work, mother asked us to come over here and check on Ryan, which we did. And this is what we found. Billings sat and stared at me, apparently hoping to make me uncomfortable. He didn't look like he believed me, but I don't think he would have given me the satisfaction of looking like he thought I was telling him the truth, even if he did. I figured he just liked making people squirm. I envisioned him as a little boy in ill-fitting rompers, pulling the wings off butterflies and trying, trying worms under a magnifying glass. My mother will be glad to verify what I've just told you. Billings rolled his eyes up at Peter and said, Why don't you tell us this friend of yours were, was dead when you called it in? Because he didn't know, I continued. We opened the door. You opened the door, Billings said, as if he'd caught me up in something. Yes. Why? Because he didn't answer the door and he hadn't answered the phone all day. We were worried about him. Why? For Christ's sake, I said loudly, losing my temper at last. His lover was killed the day before yesterday. He was distraught over that. And as if that wasn't bad enough, you people treated him like a criminal. What's going on here? The voice sounded unexpectedly from the doorway. Billing shot a glance at the door and then looked back at us. His expression spoke volumes. He looked as if he thought we'd betrayed him and he hadn't expected us to, even though he obviously detested us. Frank walked into the room, ignoring Billings, and I rose to meet him. Are you guys all right? Yeah, I said. Detective Billings and his significant other have been taking good care of us. Then, unable to hide my relief at the sight of him, my voice quivered as I added, Ryan's been killed back there. Frank went back to look at the scene. The evidence technicians arrived just as Frank rejoined us. Billings' silent partner showed them to the room. You were the one that discovered the body? Frank asked. Yeah. He was silent for a moment. He looked as if he was putting something together in his mind. Billings had risen when Frank entered the apartment, and he stood in front of his chair, glowering at nobody in particular. Peter and I watched Frank. After a minute or two, Frank exhaled and turned to me. Your mother called me yesterday morning and asked if it was all right to clean up in here. She said she wanted to do that so the place would be ready for Ryan whenever he wanted to come back home. Yes, but we didn't expect him to come back so quickly. He raised an eyebrow as if, what I'd said explained something to him. Is that why you didn't do it? Didn't do what? Clean up. I glanced at Peter, then back to Frank. We did clean up. Billings let out a snort that sounded like a pig. I would have been glad to wipe the smirk off his face with a lawnmower. Frank said half to Billings. When Mason LaPierre's body was found, wasn't there a lot of broken china? Yes, sir, said Billings. Dolls all over the place. Frank looked back at me as if looking for some sort of explanation. The confusion was starting to irk me. What? They're still back there. What? Bits of broken dolls. They're still back there, all over the floor. I could feel the color leave my face. After a brief pause, I ran down the hall to the doll room. My horror of the sight of Ryan's body was overcome by the disbelief of what I'd just heard. There was Ryan's body, the evidence techs, and the photographer were hovering over him. And there was something else, something I hadn't noticed because of my shock at finding Ryan dead. Strewn about the floor were the remains of broken dolls. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. 
So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.